Hi, Ross Duncan. Thank you, Prakash. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come here to give a talk to you. Um, when I first heard about this workshop, it was something very obvious to me what I could talk about because uh, information flow and quantum computing and so on. In the area of measurement based quantum computing, flow is a technical idea. And it's one in somewhere where you can really use this categorical algebra that's been developed in the last several years to, to show some really to show in a very beautiful way some interesting results about measurement based quantum computation. So the work that I'm going to talk about is a joint with Simon Perry. I was presented this year at ICAL. Um, though, because I don't imagine that everyone here knows anything about measurement based quantum computation, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that in general terms first. So, what is it? So, measurement based quantum computation is the idea that, unlike in a conventional quantum computation where you have some state and you apply some unitary operator to it, in measurement based computation, you start with a very large entangled state, and all you do to it is measure the parts of it one at a time. And eventually, you, you end up with the final state of what you want to compute. And because quantum measurements are non-deterministic, an interesting question is, can you carry out this procedure deterministically, or will you be defeated by the fact that measurement can go in two different ways? And we can address the question about the correctness of such programs, but I probably won't have time to talk about that. How we're going to do this is by the graphical method. So we'll take this, uh, this, this formal syntax for MBQC and turn it into a diagrammatic syntax, which is really diagrammatic notation for certain kinds of compact categories. It has a nice equational theory based on Frobenius algebras and bi-algebras. And we'll use these equational properties down here to rewrite the graphs and, and improve our theorems. Okay, so. Let me first talk about the information flow in the one-way computer. So, the first thing we want to know about quantum measurements is that if you have a two-dimensional quantum state, like this one, so it's, these are the basis vectors, 0 and 1, then I could measure it, say, with respect to the z observable, and then there will be two possible outcomes corresponding to the eigenvectors of that, of that matrix. Right? So I, I measure z, and I can see 0 or 1 with some probability depending on the initial state was. If I measure this other thing, I have these two vectors, and I see the other with some probability. But if I have a larger state, oh, so, sorry, the important thing I should not mention here is, and then after you've done this measurement, you don't just see this outcome, you actually change the state, right? So it's, the new state is the eigenvector of the thing you observe. So in the measurement-based model, the one-way model, we have a large array of qubits all initialized in this plus state, and then you couple them to each other with this, uh, this interaction here, which breaks entanglement between the qubits. And then you might have some inputs, so you couple them onto your, your resource state, and then you start to measure them. And as you measure them, they become disentangled from the, the main state and effectively destroyed. But as they get measured, the fact that you projected one of them on some new state has an effect on the other qubits. Okay, so you go through, you consume your cluster, and you have some, some output at the end. That's why it's called the one-way computer, because most of the stuff gets used up in the process. And then you might want to correct your, your remaining qubit in some, in some kind of family output. So here's the point. So every time we do one of these measurements, there are two possible outcomes. It's yay or boo. Right? And so you have this branching tree of, of possible runs of your program. And so the, the question, what you can do though, is you can use the, uh, the information you got here by measuring this, you knew which, which outcome you saw, so you can use that information to modify what you do with the next measurement. It's called an adaptive measurement. And so what you, you're hoping to do is to, by carefully choosing the next measurement, to bring all the branches of this tree back to the final, the final endpoint, so you have the deterministic computation. Okay? So that's it. Okay, so let's be a little bit more formal and let's use some, some syntax to describe these kind of things. So this is measurement calculus by, by these guys, for cash being one of them. And so the syntax is as follows. You have uh, an operator N and I, which says I is a fresh qubit initialized in this state. You have EIJ, which says entangled I and J, with this CZ operation I showed a minute ago. You have this slightly complicated, complicated looking measurement operator, 
which says measure qubit i with alpha is a parameter for the basis that you measure in, and s and t are Boolean variables which are used to change this, this expression of what basis you're measuring in. And the idea is that s and t will be the outcomes of some previous measurement. This is how you get the, the adaptive measurements. Okay, and there are also these correction operators where you can use a Pauli at the end, again, dependent on some Boolean variable. And so it's a, it's a theorem in measurement calculus that everything, every program you can write down with this syntax is equivalent to one where the operations come in this order. Okay, so that's called standardization. But that formal syntax slightly conceals the underlying geometric nature of this stuff. So if I take this example pattern, we can see we're going to have some fresh qubits, we're going to entangle them, we're going to measure some of them, and then we'll do some corrections. But if we unpack this a little bit, you can see that we're going to define what's called the geometry. So first of all, if we look at the E part, you see we have this entangled graph. There's four indexes in this expression, so there's four qubits, and their length like that. And the N operator is telling you that three and four are fresh qubits, therefore implicitly one and two are inputs. Likewise, because two and three are measured, it means that one and four are output qubits. And so these three pieces of information the graph and the sets of inputs and outputs of what's called the geometry. Now the geometry is important for the property of flow. So the idea is as follows. Uh, a flow, given this geometry, is a, is a function and a partial order. And it has the property that when you give a, a non-output qubit to this function, it gives you back something which is connected to its input in the graph. The, the image of the qubit will be after the, uh, the initial value in this order. And, and then you have this second uh, condition, which I won't really mention. But the idea is that the, the, this f function will tell you the successor of the qubit you're looking at in some kind of order. And the theorem is that if you can put a flow on this geometry, then I can find some program using that geometry which can be executed deterministically. Okay? Let me just say a little bit more about that. So, imagine that we've got some measuring device for the one qubit basis. So there's two outcomes, the yay and the two, right? And it's, but mathematically, that's equivalent to saying that actually I did the same projection, but first of all, I saw this error term, which is good. It's effectively flipping from one to zero. And so in flow, I take my geometry and say I measure this qubit v, and I see the wrong answer. The flow is going to tell me which qubit I need to do to my modification to in order to get deterministic computation. And these guys will cancel out. And so if you iterate the function f from, from some input, it's basically determining a path through the state to the output. And so if you think of these, these blue lines as being, you can think of them as being logical qubits in some quantum circuit, which is equivalent to this computation that you're doing by measuring. And I think when you see this picture, you don't have to think too hard to see if I already know this, that I can probably draw the circuit that's going to do this computation. And it's indeed, you can always translate a measurement-based computation which has a flow into a circuit. But it's not a, um, having a flow is a sufficient condition would be determined, but it's not a necessary condition. So it's generalized by something called the G-flow. And what you do here is instead of having one correcting qubit, you have a set of them. And there are some slightly complicated parity conditions, but the idea is if I want to correct this qubit, I might use these two. But if I act on this one, I have to be careful because this one can be connected to something which happened in the past. This, this order telling you the order in which you're going to do things. And so I can't just change this one because it's going to mess up my computation through correlations created here. So I have to correct this one as well. And so the past has to be evenly connected to the correcting set so that all these things will cancel out. Okay? And the theorem then says that if you have a G-flow, then, sorry, you have a G-flow if and only if there's what's called a uniformly deterministic pattern. A uniformly means that it's insensitive to the angles used in the measurement. Okay, so let me try and summarize that. So you have this measurement pattern, which I think is a low-level program, defines the geometry, which is 
really telling you about the underlying entangled resource state that you're using. And if you have flow or G flow, it's going to tell you the correction strategy you need to use to get a deterministic computation. So these things together define this uniformly deterministic pattern, but it's not necessarily the same one as you started with. In particular, the, the angles of measurement and the corrections, the, the conditional operations you put here, are not necessarily the same ones here, because you might have made a bug in this program, right? Okay, and once you have this uniformly deterministic pattern, you can get a quantum circuit. And an interesting caveat is if you have G-flow, then you can't necessarily build this without using extra qubits, ancillary qubits. So, what I'm going to try and show here is that taking all this stuff into this diagrammatic language, we can have a direct translation of the pattern which can rewrite to something which is basically the same as the geometry, but retaining some extra information from the pattern. And from that, we could directly get a quantum circuit by doing some other rewriting on this graph if the original thing was deterministic. If it's not deterministic, then it'll be a, um, a quantum circuit with some non-deterministic choices in it. But more interestingly, if we have the G-flow, we can use a different rewriting strategy to turn it into something which is like a circuit. Right? In particular, which doesn't have any ancillary qubits. And so this is what I mean by the true information flow. So in, in this one, because the, uh, the correcting set is much bigger, the, the flow is somehow not obvious. It's going backwards in time and doing who knows what it's doing. But by taking advantage of the algebraic structure that we find by translating it into the diagrammatic language, we can rec recreate a real flow and therefore avoid bringing these uh, ancillary qubits Okay. So I'm going to show some diagrams now. I want to mention I'm going to use the convention that uh, Belfried called the pessimistic diagram convention, and we go from the top to the bottom. British readers might recognise this as the Daily Mail convention. So here's the idea: we're going to have di our diagrams will be generated by these guys. So. Green dots with an angle, red dots with an angle, and H. H has exactly one input and one output, for these can have arbitrary numbers of inputs and outputs. And so we take these generators, and effectively we're going to um, consider the free comp dagger compact category generated by these guys, with the convention that the dagger is going to send at each angle to minus the angle. Okay, so that's the generator, so we get graphs, and we have some equations. I won't go into too much detail of these. Um, but allowing you to merge dots, to remove loops, to remove dots with a zero angle, assuming the, the degree of things is right. Um, if we have pi is a special value in the calculus, so it's pi can commute with this green dot and be copied however many times. And more equations say that when the Compose in this pattern, effectively you have a bi-algebra. Dots can be copied by the dots of the opposing color. This is something related to the fact that you have a Hopf algebra here. And the special rule of the H is to change the color of the dots. And H cancels with itself. Okay, so don't worry too much about that. I just also say that everything is symmetric between red and green. So all the things I showed you in green, flip them to red and vice versa. So those equations are quite a condensed presentation of a lot of properties. So in particular, if you think of things of this type, 2 and 1 and 0 and 1, then you can derive from what I showed you that you have a commutative monoid. Conversely, if you take them upside down, you have a commutative co-monoid. The rule I showed you about fusing dots is telling you that you have a special Frobenius algebra. And the most important part of it is probably this, which is saying that when you take the co-monoid of one and the monoid of the other, then this is jointly going to form a biology. <coughs> and this is going to do a lot of work for us in the, in the next part. But more, actually, let's, yeah. More importantly, you also have this Hopf algebra structure where the antipode is trivial. Right? So whenever I have parallel lines between a green and red dot, I can remove them. Okay? So 
this is just uh, some, some formal syntax. Well, I can put some semantics on it in terms of Hilbert spaces this way. And the easiest way to understand this is to look at this one and take m to be 1 and n to be 2 and alpha to be 0. And what you'll see is that this green dot is taking the 0 qubit and giving it to 2 copies of itself and the 1 qubit to 2 copies of itself. And the red will do the same for the plus and minus basis. So with this index, we can start to write down our usual things for the quantum computing. So this is the zero qubit, this is the one qubit, the plus and the minus. Some one qubit logic gates, and two qubit logic gates. And so a small example of calculation we can do using this rewriting system is this thing here. So in the previous slide, I showed you that this configuration is a C0. And what C0 does is when you give it a zero input, it does the identity on this side. When you give it a one input, it does a, a highlight x on this side. So here I'm giving it a one input. So I can use my equation, say that the pi commutes and that that gets copied to do this using the spider rule. So now you see that my, my control input has been preserved and now I'm acting with the highlight x in the other one. It's a very simple example of the reasoning we're going to use. So first question we can ask, since we can give these things interpretation as, as linear operators, which diagrams are quantum circuits? And so you have this slightly complicated looking um, condition here. So what it says is that if I have the green dots and the red dots and all the boundary points, then I should be able to cover them with a set of disjoint directed paths, at each of which path should end in an output. Uh, and every cycle in this diagram, which overlaps with two paths of this, this path cover, have to, the cycle has to traverse an edge in the opposite direction to the path. This is kind of a causality condition. And I'm saying it has to be three colored because I want the diagram to be minimal with respect to this spider rule, which lets me fuse dots together. So that's not technically required. But so for example, is this one a circuit? Yes, that's a circuit. There's my path cover. And it's actually equivalent to this thing, which is more obviously a circuit consisting of a free input, a constant input, and a two two qubit gates. And with this one is not because you have this causally consistent loop. Okay. Okay, so the theorem then says that if diagram D is circuit-like in this the sense I said before, then its denotation is a unitary embedding. Meaning it's a unitary map where some of the inputs are already given to you. Okay, so being circuit-like is a little bit stronger than being unitary embedding because of these technical site conditions but you can more or less ignore that. So it's diagrams and circuits, so you can see from that that any quantum circuit can be written down in this language, and you can prove some equations about that. But how about the, the one-way model? So the basis of, of our resource state is what's called a graph state. So this is the, the qubits which are being entangled with each other. And you can see this is the, the usual expression for it, but in a diagrammatic language, if this is the, the, the graph that we're trying to translate, then it looks like this. You just put the qubits and you put the CZ entangling gate everywhere that the, uh, there should be a, an edge in the graph. And you can use the spider rule then to reduce that further by joining all these green dots together and getting again this triangle. So you see it's almost the same. You have a green dot where there's a vertex, you have an H where there's an edge, and for each qubit you have an outgoing line. Interestingly, if it's a two colorable graph, you can move all the H's to the outside using this commutation rule, and you have a nice expression of two colors, which will be will make some of our pictures a bit simpler. Okay, so let's think about the one-way model. So uh, here's an example of a pattern again. I mean, I'm just going to ignore the measurements for the moment. I'm just going to assume they're projections onto some fixed qubit. So I can have here my fresh qubits, here are my entangling operations, which are described by these it's here, and I'm measuring these ones, zero angles, so that's the same as just projecting onto the plus. So that's here. So you see two inputs, two outputs. Okay. So we can use this kind of translation, we can look, let's suppose we have a diagram with a flow. Now what we do is we start, I just showed you with some diagram, now we can reduce it to uh, its geometry using the spider rule. And then, because you know it has a flow, you can 
chase the flow through the diagram, and just by rearranging it, get a circuit. And then you can do some simplifications to it afterwards. But the main point is, if the underlying graph state has a flow, then the diagram you get is a circuit-like diagram. So the flow is really giving you sort of virtual flow in the, the measurement-based thing, is giving you a real <coughs> temporal flow in the induced circuit. And so we can use some, some rules to simplify this and show that this was in fact the identity that I was computing. Okay, so this is the main interesting point of this talk. So what about the G-flow? So what I'm going to show you now is if I have a geometry which has a G-flow, then I can transform the diagram into something which has a flow and no additional qubits. Okay, so I'm going to use this Hopf algebra property. So you remember this picture from a minute ago. Right, so we have this Hopf algebra. In particular, Hopf algebras have a normal form theorem which says that if I have any old expression like this, that I can reduce it to something simpler. And the way you do it, because I have a trivial antipode, I just count the paths and then take that number mod 2 and put that number of paths back in. It's a very simple expression. And so these things are almost graph states. In particular, we have this, this kind of situation. The thing on the right looks like a G flow. So I have here my qubit, this is my correcting set, these are the things in the past of my qubit, and they're evenly connected to the correcting set. So I use my normal form theorem to find some, some other diagram, which has been cunningly constructed so that it has a G flow down here. And the key property is that whenever I do this, this the G flow in my new diagram is small. And so by induction, I can reduce this correcting set down to a singleton everywhere. And so now I've got a flow. And essentially what you're doing is trading parallelism for sequentiality. More qubits in depth, not in width. Okay, okay so I was ignoring the, uh, the fact that we have measurements here which are non-deterministic. So let's try and treat that just to finish things off. So you remember this picture. The idea is if I have a positive outcome, it's just a projection. If I have the negative outcome, it's really just a positive projection preceded by a flip. Well, that, that was a cartoon. So this is what it should look like. So in the measurement based world, we're um, using the plus and minus basis, not the zero one. And this is the corresponding flip in my diagrammatic language. So, a quick example, this is going to compute the Hadamard. So this is the, the yay case, so I'm just projecting onto plus. And you can see that I can just go through, and I get Hadamard. But in the blue case, I have this pi there, right? And so I can try and do my rewriting again, that comes through, and now I need, know that I need to put a correction down here. If I do that, then these will cancel out. So, how to, to capture this idea of the dependence of later things and earlier things is I'm going to annotate my diagrams with a further piece of information, namely a set of Boolean variables. The H doesn't get anything, it's always a constant. Okay, so, I have that. And the idea is that when I have some set of, of variables, I'll have a valuation function into the Booleans. And then I have a uh, an induced map from this diagram with the variables to one without it just by following this expression which whenever alpha, sorry, whenever the product of these variables is zero then I replace alpha with zero. If I don't, if this comes out to be one then I leave alpha as one. Oh, sorry, I leave alpha as alpha. And that, this collection of valuation maps induces a super operator which gives you the whole probabilistic description of this computation. This is exactly like the, the branch maps of the original semantics and measurement variables. So here's how it looks in a small example. So this is a measurement, right? So this, this is the variable is telling you what the outcome of this measurement was. And so the two possibilities are x goes to 0, in which case I get the plus projection, x goes to 1, I get the other projection. And that's the semantics down here. Right? So I can now go back and modify all my rules just by Essentially, the same rules, and you just have to check that they will, each, the two sides of the equation will be the same for every valuation. And this basically is a condition on 
where there is the same set of variables here. Though in some cases it doesn't matter, like here. They don't, so this one allows me to fuse things, but I could also pull them apart. But here I have different sets, so instead of fusing, I just commute. That's the only real difference. Does it have to be disjoint? No. Okay, and so similar annotations for the other rules. And with colors exchanged. So now I can translate this measurement calculus syntax into a diagrammatic syntax exactly. So the new qubit is just the same. The entangling operation is just the same. Measuring qubit i, I uh, put in here a new variable i, which is going to tell me which outcome I saw, and then the corresponding projection. And my correction operators are just a, a, a red dot or a green dot with pi, and again, a variable which comes from here. So a simple example of this would be this one. So you can see it looks quite complicated, and even in the diagram it still looks quite complicated, so you can see the structure a little bit more easily. But through a rewrite sequence, I can pull all these conditional operations through here, and then they come out to the end here, at least have the same variables, the same variables, so they can cancel out, and I get the C0. So the two things have been proved here. First of all, this is going to compute the C0, and second of all, because I eliminated all these conditional things, it's doing it deterministic. So that was an example, but can you do it in general? And the idea is, yes, you can if you have a flow. And I'm running a little short on time, so I won't go into the details of this. But basically, you use the flow to put a direction on some of your edges, and then the flow tells you where you have to pull these operations along the graph. So again, information flow at will. So here's a quick example. Here's a pattern. Here's the flow. And we just watch. Things starting from the left, yeah. It comes through there by commuting, changes color, gets copied, and uh, these two cancel. <coughs> and then it just goes through and yeah, they all cancel out. So this is deterministic. What's interesting to note is that if it hadn't been deterministic, you would have something left in there with the variable. And you can use, and if you sufficiently annotate this graph of information about the original pattern, you can use the presence of that remaining conditional thing to tell you where you screwed up in your original computation, where you had to put a correction that you didn't put. Okay. And so the theorem is that this strategy is going to terminate in either one or two states. Either you got rid of them all, which case you're deterministic, or you didn't, which case you're Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the reference. Thanks again.